Okay, welcome everybody. How are you doing? Today I'm gonna be reacting to the strangest appearance of D V Cooper. 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 You know you know about it? No. I have no no clue of what's in this video or who is he. So this is for reaction and yeah subscribe for more thank you and this video is gonna be divided in two parts because the video i'm watching right now is 20 minutes and this is gonna be too long to you know put in one video and let's get started this week on buzzfeed unsolved we discussed the famous case of db cooper a case that the fbi is referred to oh sorry i, I forgot to say who is this video from it's from buzzfeed blue but yeah as one of the great unsolved mysteries in FBI history. It's also considered one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in U.S. history. It's oh. a favorite of mine. Yeah, I've heard of this one a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, you haven't heard it? I like haven't I'm about to tell it. Oh. I haven't heard it. Anything Boy. <laughs> okay, let's strap in. in. Let's strap in, baby. Let's get into it. On Wednesday, November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving. Isn't that your mom was born? 1971? Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I'm not saying her age. A man going by the name Dan Cooper bought a twenty dollar one way ticket on Northwest Orient Airlines with cash for flight number three zero five from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Cooper was described as being in his mid forties and wearing a business suit, a black rain type overcoat, brown shoes, a white shirt, and black tie. He must have been so handsome. He carried a dark. Oh, that's my dad. No, wait. No, my dad's not in their forties. You can't tell the age of your parents. I don't know what their age are. Neither. <laughs> no, he's in the late thirties. Never mind. Briefcase and a four-inch by twelve-inch by fourteen-inch paper Too bag. Too much information. Before the plane took off, Cooper, seated in seat eighteen C, ordered a bourbon and soda. He seems like a cool oh, yeah. dude. I don't. I don't think he even ordered the bourbon and soda to calm his nerves. I think no, he was probably just like he's a badass. Soda. No, I'm DB Cooper. Mystery man, give me a bourbon. <laughs> After the plane had taken off, a little after 3 p.m., <laughs> Cooper <laughs> handed the stewardess a note. At first, she just put it in her pocket without looking at it. But then Cooper said, quote, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. End quote. <laughs> yeah, what's so funny about that? He has a bomb. I think it's funny that he passed her a note to be discreet about it. <laughs> I'm going to keep this on the down low. And then she was just like, thanks, and walked away. He was like, hey, uh... You might want to read that because I've got a bomb. Uh, <laughs> oh, God damn it. Uh, yeah, I got a bomb, everybody. Cooper told her the bomb was in his briefcase and asked her to sit next to him. He opened his briefcase to show red colored sticks surrounded by an array of wires. Oh, After surprised. that, Cooper asked the stewardess to write down what he was saying and take it to the captain. Quote, I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash. Put in a knapsack. All my weak credit cards are probably more company names. Everyone is a scary fan right now. Yeah, mine is I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, why does he want front? Is he gonna land by his stomach and be like, ah! I don't know, man. You <laughs> should learn about parachutes. I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure they both come I want together. a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff, or I'll do the job. No funny stuff. <laughs> I also like how he says, "Do the job." I'll do the job. Like that's his threat, which actually to that's me, a badass. he's not a he's not a dime store criminal. Let's just say that. No. I was, yeah, he's, he's. I'm on board with the coop train. Me too. I'm a fan of this guy. You a coop head? Uh, I'm a coop head. One odd detail was that Cooper asked for the two hundred thousand dollars to be exclusively in twenty dollar bills. I would have. Why twenty bills? I would ask Hamilton only. <laughs> <laughs> Hamilton's please. Just because. Oh, I, I want some freaking. Jackson. I want only Jacksons, okay? Because uh, my crush name is Jackson, so I want to have him for... The flight landed in Seattle, and Cooper exchanged the 36 passengers on the plane for the money and the parachutes he had requested. 
Cooper kept some crew members on the plane and had the plane take off for Mexico City, requesting that the plane remain below 10,000 feet. Disgusting. During the second half of the flight, Cooper put on a pair of dark wraparound sunglasses. Dark. Okay, why did he, did they have to say dark wraparound glasses? He put on sunglasses, simple as that. With dark rims that <laughs> I want to be one of the men in black. <laughs> would later become part of the sketch that would become famous for anybody familiar with the case. Yeah, I'm just imagining like a camera just just pushing in on him as he's like. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> if we were in today's age, this guy would definitely have headphones in playing Spotify playlists of epic soundtracks. You'd like have he, one of those shitty hoverboards. Not an actual hoverboard, but yeah, the he'd be like, or I'll do the job. <laughs> He'd take out his wheels, put them down, <laughs> start moving up and down the aisle. <laughs> that sack. Or I'll do the job. A little after 8 p.m., when the plane was somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, Cooper jumped out of the rear doors of the Boeing 727 with two of the parachutes and the money, never to be seen again. One thing worth noting is that Cooper took off his black J.C. Penney clip-on tie before jumping a piece of evidence that the FBI was able to procure a DNA sample from. You think James Bond ever wore a clip-on bow tie? Yeah, I guess. That, wow, you really... That does kind of... That's kind of a... Takes the wind out well, of my maybe, sails. Well, maybe if he, like, knew he had to do it quick, then that was, Still, like, an efficiency thing. If he was like, I'm gonna put my sunglasses on, it'll look cool if he was like... <laughs> <laughs> With the DNA sample from the tie, let's jump into the investigation launched to identify the man who called himself Dan Cooper. The case was called Norjack, standing for Northwest Hijacking, and would last decades. The plane was intensely searched for evidence. Desperate to find Cooper's identity, there was extra interest in $20 bills, because the FBI had released the serial numbers of the bills stolen by Cooper. Remarkably, in 1980, nine years after Cooper's escape, a young boy found a rotting package filled with $20 bills that matched the ransom money serial numbers. There was five... Th okay, 20 years later, what are the points of this? Nine. Oh, nine years later? Sorry, it's because I go stuff with the bills. Bills on a beach at Tina Bar while making a campfire with his father. People theorized that when Cooper jumped out, the money possibly fell into the Washougal River before eventually making its way to Tina Bar. Tina <laughs> Hey, Tina, I came home. I got some Jacksons for you. <laughs> That's basically all they theorized. I'm just imagining him just jumping out and immediately just losing grip of all the bags. Just a man floating to earth with a bunch of money flying around. Him, like, ah! Though, this discovery would ultimately lead to nothing as the FBI scoured to nothing. What is the point of this? The surrounding beaches, finding nothing else. In the year that followed the hijacking, several letters were sent to the FBI. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and Seattle Times, either confessing to the crime, eulogizing a recently deceased D.B. Cooper, or claiming to be his brother. In fact, in November 1972... And his brother was Jackson. <laughs> two men. Donald Sylvester Murphy and William John Lewis were taken into federal custody on charges of extortion for impersonating Cooper and selling his tell-all story to a tabloid. It seems like a bad idea to make your get-rich-quick scheme to be to impersonate a criminal. Yeah, that's, that's, uh... That I wouldn't be like, ha hey, it's me, the Zodiac Killer. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> what? Oh, oh. <laughs> Leads were tracked all over the country, and more than 800 suspects were considered over the first five years of the investigation. All but 24 suspects were eliminated from consideration. One peculiar fact is that the initials DB have no actual relevance to the case, and the FBI isn't sure where they came from. It was reportedly a mistake from a wire service that caused him to be called D.B. Cooper instead of Dan Cooper, which is how he presented himself when buying the plane ticket. D.B. sounds cooler. It does. Dan just sounds like your neighbor who's, like, asking to borrow a lawnmower. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Physical description of Cooper. D.B. is like, oh, yeah. What's up, D.B.? Yeah. Gang. <laughs> the first thought to be very accurate. Two flight attendants spent hours with him on the plane and were interviewed separately the night the hijacking occurred. They gave nearly identical descriptions of Cooper, saying that he was five foot ten to six feet, 170 to 180 pounds, in his mid 40s, and brown eyes. People who interacted with him on the ground gave similar descriptions. His voice was described as low, no particular accent, but spoke with an intelligent vocabulary. I would like some bourbon and some. Sounds like a terrifying <laughs> series. It's me, Dan. 
<laughs> the charge against Cooper was original. air piracy. Huh? <laughs> Is he a pirate now? <laughs> Due to limitations, and as time okay. went on, with no suspects being found guilty, a grand jury later indicted Cooper for violating the Hobbs Act. The Hobbs Act is a federal statute designed to prevent extortion and has no statute of limitations, meaning if Cooper was found tomorrow, he could be charged even though the FBI... Tomorrow, not in the end of the day, but... If he was found tomorrow, then... Yeah, the investigation has since been called off. Before we jump into suspects, I'd like to point out that the pilot told officials that he himself chose the route the plane took, not Cooper. Cooper only requested his end destination of Mexico City, a decision that is a bit puzzling when you consider the fact that Cooper knew he intended to jump out of a plane. This seemingly eliminates the possibility of Cooper having an accomplice, as there was no coordination about the route from Cooper and therefore no coordinated drop point. This is what always interested me about this case. It's because it seems so meticulously planned up until he jumps. Maybe he's one of those people that like goes out to do things. Like I'm kind of like this too, where I'll go out and I'm like, I'll figure it out in the moment. Or he was confident and he nailed it. With that, let's jump into the suspects. The first suspect is Richard Floyd McCoy, who is the favorite suspect of former FBI agent Russell Kalam and former federal probation officer Bernie Rhodes. The two men even wrote a book about the case. In April 1972, five months after Cooper's escape, the FBI arrested Richard Floyd McCoy for hijacking an airplane. When examined, the McCoy heist is definitely similar to the Cooper heist. Like Cooper, McCoy hijacked a plane and parachuted off of it. McCoy jumped out the back rear staircase of a Boeing 727, the same plane Cooper jumped out of, using the same method. Also like Cooper, McCoy requested four parachutes and was calm during the heist. Reportedly, both of the men passed notes to the flight attendants claiming a bomb was on board. A detail that becomes more compelling when you learn that both... Maybe it was his brother. <laughs> Hot twist. <laughs> McCoy's notes reportedly contained the phrase, no funny stuff. Another suspicious coincidence is the fact that both crimes reportedly occurred while Brigham Young University, where McCoy was a student, was on break. He was a student? In this theory, yes. I was thinking about it in like a, a cold, hard, criminal way. I wasn't thinking like, spring break! <laughs> that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> Do you think that's what he yelled when he jumped out the plane? <laughs> spring break! He just falls out to his death. Spring break! <laughs> Perhaps the most riveting detail is that according to Kalam and Rhodes, members of McCoy's family identified an object left on the plane by Cooper, an object that was never publicly identified. Some parts of the internet seem to believe that this object was a Brigham Young University medallion with McCoy's initials on it, but this seems to stem from the Wikipedia page on the case, which makes this most likely complete horseshit. I mean, the thing is, if that's the case, case closed. Yeah. Brigham Young University medallion with his initials on it, I mean... But it's not definitive, it's not... They just said unidentified object, which is probably like a stick of gum or some stupid right. shit like oh, that. Oh, he chewed... Uh, he chewed Wrigley's. Regardless if McCoy is Cooper or not, the FBI eventually ruled out McCoy as a suspect for the Cooper case, mainly because he didn't match the descriptions of Cooper given by the flight attendants, though Kalam and Rhodes listed the two men as looking similar. Additionally, according to FBI archives, McCoy was home with his family for Thanksgiving dinner in Utah the day after the hijacking. Unlike Cooper, McCoy was actually caught after his heist and sentenced to 45 years in prison. McCoy would actually escape from prison in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and later die in a gunfight with FBI agents in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I just love how that story has so many like, oh, he's out. He's not yeah. out. He's out. He's oh. out. Shot to death. Oh. Yeah, it's funny because you think you got him and then he dies and then... Something else comes up and you realize, oh no, he's not him. This kid is a whole mess. Oh my god. <laughs> that was a roller coaster of emotions right there. The second. Um, well, I'm gonna leave it right there for the first part. So thank you for watching.